great mutiny, the mutiny, and so on. 24 different things. What it meant really was a revolt against the British. The British ruled India just as they ruled Trinidad. And this is how we are here. You may find it very strange, but at the end of the lecture, you may discover that our people quite came here as prisoners of war, right? Rather than as free men. But that's for you to decide. When I do history, and when I do research on anything, I try to read in between the lines, that is, what is there written, just as Dr. Jerome will do later on. When he puts, puts forward his, the facts on the massacre, he will also do his interpretation, because the commissioner had his own interpretation of what happened. He thought nothing happened at the end of the day. Right? It was a collision, not a mutiny, not a war, whatever. But that was small scale compared to what happened in India. But one of the things you'll find, those of you who are interested, it's been 20 years since I've been interested in reading about the mutiny. I only read about it recently to do this paper over the last three weeks. If I didn't have the time to call you all and so on, I, forgive me for that because it took a little time. But what was happening here, we have some quotable quotes. The first quote, the twin goals of the war, and I put in brackets again for, for, to explain, the great Indian mutiny, were Ustin, the Ferengi Lutheran, that in Hindi means, in English, the foreign looters which is the British. And establishing a Hindustan, and I'll put in brackets, an India of Hindus and Muslims, where the multifarious castes and sects were all integrated and assured of the safety of their life, religion, honor, and property. This exemplified the extraordinary vision of the rebels. This is what the rebels, the mutineers, the sepoys, whatever you call them, were all about. It's not written in the British books because the British just wanted to rule as they wanted to rule Trinidad and keep you blind and stupid. So this is what the guys wanted to do in India, get rid of the British, put in an Indian government. Just as happened when Dr. Eric Williams here brought independence, and when Gandhi brought independence, 94 years after this. But we'll see again why it took 94 years. So this comes from Smita Pandey, no relation to um, Basil Pandey, one of our renowned politicians. No relation to Mangal Pandey, who started the election. The, um, I say the election. <laughs> who started the campaign, who fired off the revolt in India. Smita Pandey, the vision of the rebels during 1857, aspects of mobilization, organization, and resistance. Now books are being written by Indians about their history. We in Trinidad have to start writing about our history. We have too few historians um, in terms of at the university and so on. Too few in some, very few. The, some of them are, have gone to the great field. But somebody needs to take up that mantle and teach us where we came from, where are we going. Portable quotes continue. The political objective of the uprising, again a different name for the revolt, was to overthrow British rule and replace it with an alternate order that would ensure the safety of people's lives in this world and in the next world. This is what they were fighting for, as they saw it. Right? In most religions, you believe in a next world, a greater world, a better world, a heaven. This is what they were talking about. That is improving themselves, uh, not only materially, but also spiritually. And that's from Shobhudanga, that is a publisher on the internet, which, um, where you'll find books on the revolt. And then, sorry to say, in the end, what happens? In the end, surprise, surprise, is the, the Indian sepoys of the East India Company, that is they had soldiers with them. In Trinidad, Jerome will tell you they had Irish soldiers and Barbadian soldiers. 
right? Those are the guys who shock the Indians dead out there. Not local Trinidadians. The Trinidadians who consider too stupid to become policemen. So in the end, it was the Indian seaports, Indian soldiers of the British East India Company who were paid soldiers, mercenaries, I think, are here, who won India for them. So they, people were fighting for independence, and others were fighting for the British. The soldiers were paid three times the agricultural labor. So if the labor was earning one dollar for the day, the sepoys were earning three dollars. And for that two dollars, well, they sent you and me back in here. That's how I interpret the history. Two dollars is what it cost at the end of the day. India and the British Empire, we know about it, we've seen, we've heard the history. Oh, and there's a great movie called Mangal Pandey, The Rising, which you'll see in subtitles, which tells you the story prior to the revolt. When the revolt started, is the end of that film. And it was very interesting, the heroine in that film, who is a prostitute, tells Mangal Pandey, when, she, when he rebuked her, he said, she said, we sell our bodies, but you men have sold your souls to the British. Take a look at the film, it's very interesting. So India was the strategic core of the British Empire. For 200 years, India was a jewel in the British Imperial Crown. Reminds one of Petro Trin, Trin Mine in Trinidad the jewel of the crown. British conquest and annexation began in 1757, and I'm starting there, but the British were there long before that, for simplicity, with the Battle of Plassey. Robert Clive, who is called the British Conquistador, remember the Spanish Conquistadors came here, took away this land from the Caribs and Arabs, killed them and took the land, and then others came, the French, then the British and then they brought us here to work. They brought man and bison to do the hard work here. The bison also came from India, still here, as you all would have seen in the films. So at the Battle of Plassey, Robert Clive, the British con conquistador, got the commander of the Nawab's forces, the Nawab is the local king, Mir Jafar, who is the commander, to desert his master on the battlefield. He paid him off. How much have I paid him off, we don't know, but that again is an interesting part of life. People get paid off to do different things and to take their master's place. So Mir Jafar was installed in his master's place, right? As prime minister, I guess he was now called Nawab. So he and Robert Clive, they fixed up a little deal and that was the end of that. And enormous properties across India fell into the East India Company, and we'll call it the company later on, into that ownership. And Bengal was taken on a direct company administration in 1765. The, bank, the company became the Diwan of Bengal. That is the ruler, and by the way, the ruler also taxes. Right? That is why we run governments through taxes. Bengal, in the history here, now you'll see the presidency of Bengal stretched from Calcutta, which was initially conquered, 800, 900 miles west, straight up to Delhi, and also into Punjab eventually. And that's the history, it's a very checkered history, but it's, all, it's easy to understand if you conquer San Fernando first and you set up, this is Calcutta, then you go and you conquer Point. 15 years later, you go and you conquer Port of Spain 20 years later, and then you conquer Maruga and so on. That's the idea. They conquered almost the whole of India, and they ruled India for more than 200 years. The events of 1857 marked a major watershed in the history of the empire. It was the most terrible mutiny, they said, in the annals of war. Colonial subjugation was at the center and extended to all basic institutions, political, economic, and cultural. So that is Stein, an English, um, English writer, 
and by 1837, 50,000 British ruled over 90 million Indians through the East India Company. Same thing happened in Trinidad, by the way, I don't know the numbers, but you had a British administration, and the story is very same. Keep in mind that, that picture all the time, so you'll better understand your Trinidad history. About 1860, Britain had 2% of the world's population, but was responsible for 20% of the world's trade, and 40% of the trade in manufactured goods. In India, they prevented people from planting the cotton and making clothes. And they had them plant the cotton for export to Manchester and so on. Great towns, when I lived in, in England, I visited. And when I went first to London, I looked at this great city of stone, concrete. And I said, well, these guys had a right to conquer the world. I've never seen anything like this in my life. And then when I listen to the English films and documentaries, remember to listen to your documentaries. Dr. Jerome Tiloxi is on the parliamentary documentaries. I look at that all the time, the parliamentary channel. I learned that way. Glasgow, Liverpool, London, Southampton, all these towns were built on slave and indentured labor. So what they were doing was taking all the profits from the countries, including Trinidad, and using it in England, to build England. And that is what imperialism and so on is about. Jerome will talk a little bit about that because he teaches those things at the university. The Great Indian Mutiny was fed by resentment against this British rule, and the American newspapers, remember the Americans had, had a revolution to drive the British out several decades before. And the Americans talk about the oppressive, exploitative British government. I'll shorten it quite a bit, but you take away the beauty of the essay when you have to do this thing in point forms, but points, points form, but part of the part of the exercise. So there was an accumulation of factors over there. And what were these factors? What happened in India over the 200 years that the Indians decided to revolt? There was the invasive style social, British style social reforms. They wanted to make the Indian a black, and they called him black, a black Englishman, right? Through religion, through education, and so on. But they didn't want to make him free. He, want, he had to decide to make himself free by creating a mutiny. But we look at some of those social reforms later. The doctrine of lapse, which was very important, because many of the fighters and leaders in the mutiny, had been, their land had been taken away. So Tanti Atope, the one of the great revolutionaries, who was eventually betrayed by his own cobra and hung by the British, um, his land was taken away because he was the adopted son of the local people. He went and he squatted in Kanpur, and when the guys revolted, he joined and he became the leader. Right? The Rani of Jansi, the same thing. Her adopted son could not inherit the land. So she fought. And in the photos and pictures, you see her fighting with her baby strapped on her back and her sword in her hand. Right? She was killed by a British soldier in, in the battlefield. Uh, and so it is different leaders and so on at different times. Their kingdoms were taken away. There must, there must have been about 300 different kingdoms in India. India was not a united place. And this is why the guys were fighting one another. Point Fortin was fighting Labri. Labri was fighting Santalan. Rosilap was fighting the, as we still do. That was meant for the laugh. <laughs> but you understand the history. Land reforms and heavy land taxes. Well, some of you may have some things to say about that, but I do not enter the political scheme. An inherently unfair justice system. When an Englishman took advantage of an Indian, there was a long process, a series of appeal courts, as Gregory will know, one series of 
appeals. And by the time you reach the top, there's a month or two or a year finish. You may be dead, killed, whatever. Your grievance has not been heard. So this is what happened in India, and this is why they fought. This is very important. In interference in the thousands of years old traditions and customs of India, British came and they thought my civilization is better. I'll make you an Englishman now in 20 years. Right? In, in, interestingly, the first guys who came as conquerors, as they come in every land, they married the Indian women. And that was, uh, that helped rather. I don't know their, their real intentions, but it helped in solidifying their kingdoms. And this is what was done in America with the native Indians, and to some extent in Trinidad with the natives here. So things like the abolition of sati, that is the cremation of widows with their dead husbands. You put the widows screaming on top of the empire, as we have at the creek here. Imagine that, and they go with their husbands to the next world. But some of you guys may still want to do that, but I'll have no part of it. <laughs> Child marriage, which only re this year or last year we had lots bringing up that marriage age to 18, which is a good and proper age, but I think maybe 24 is better. Right, in terms of maturity. The promotion of the education of girl children, they did not want that in India. When I next lecture to you, I to, I'll talk about um, the uh, education of the Canadian mission schools in Sri Lanka, starting in 1868 with John Morton. And he's done for all women and all men here, more than many other educators have done here in Sri Lanka and in the world. Almost commented on present day and guys, but again, I would not do that. Child marriage, you said, the promotion of education of girl children, which I believe is wrong. That is, everybody is equal. Everybody is equal, a man and equal. I tell my wife that and she believes me. <laughs> and one of the things I learned at university 40 years ago when I went to university to do my bachelor's degree. There was one woman engineer. And I said, well, what, 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 what are they going on? What is lady doing? She feels she's a man? No, I tell you, hey, I'm glad there are so many women engineers. I've worked with them in Trinidad, so. Um, and I think that is how the great God need us equal. That's my own humble view. Remarriage of widows. Widows for, for the first time able to remarry. Right? Before they just had to wear white clothes, as you saw in the movies, and they could not marry. And remember, women who were married, they were 13, 14 years old. So they had to live their whole life without companionship. And those things were wrong, but these are the things they fought for. And you'll see that since fighting for the wrong side. And the Indian of those times would prefer dying instead of changing this religion. That is what is said in the books. Then there was segregation and discrimination against Indians in the army and civil service. Well, I see a lot of that in the papers here. And in the police service, it's 75% African and 25% Indian. Long time ago, 1884, it was 0% local African. Indians were nowhere in the picture for historical, sociological, political, and all kinds of reasons, insularity and whatnot. I've spoken to my cousins, I always speak to them, the other ones, I'm glad some of them are here. But when they tell you, you know, people say it's um, history and geography and this and that. Here you have it, it's discrimination. Right? And that is what happened in Trinidad. Segregation and discrimination. And not only the segregation, they did not mix with the Indian sepoys. So your British commanders, we live in a little bungalows away in the cantonment, and the soldiers will live in the barracks on the side, just as the Indians and the Africans might be. Because I always talk about slavery and indentation. They both tied in. They were both exploitative systems, discrimination, segregation on the estates and so on. And then the Indians were very skeptical. The English had said we came here to rule you, to civilize you. Indians had their own civilization. They were there a million years ago in India, right? Mankind came from Africa seven million years ago. 
and he migrated, he walked across the continent. There were no great seas to cross. Uh, the Red Sea maybe in a little boat you cross that. They walked into Arabia, into Persia, and into India. And then they took ships and they reached Australia and all those Pacific Islands. So mankind has been in India a million years. In Africa, seven million. God created this great world and he must have had some reason for that. Right? We must search and figure out that reason in our own minds. <coughs> I come to Mangal Pandey, the first martyr. Mangal Pandey was born in a Brahmin family. The Brahmin family is the highest caste of Indians. They are the ones who are the religious leaders, the teachers in religion, and so on. He was born in Baliya, Azamgar, Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh is where most of the Indians of Trinidad come from. I have visited you all who came only saw the pictures and so on. Uttar Pradesh is a vast country, a few hundred miles across by north to south. India is a thousand and more miles from the Himalayas to the south coast, Kanya Kumari. It's about 800 uh, miles across from Bombay to Calcutta. It's a huge subcontinent. It's bigger than Europe. Certainly much bigger than England. England is, I think, smaller than Guyana, next door. But they rule the world. So this is how history goes. We will see later that many of the Indians who came here came from Uttar Pradesh, state, including Azamda. I know a family in Rusila, where their great grandfather came from, Azamda. Many people know their history. Uh, it's time you start reading and understanding your own history. The archives are in Poland's Bay. Go check, check your ship's records and the estate records. Check your families and get that oral history before it's lost, before they go to the Great Beyond. On 29th March 1857, and it's important to remember the dates, so we see the sequence of the events. Pande declared, and this is not found in the English text at all, they say he led an incident. And then having read the Indian text, and you could read the internet as well. And you'll see in the bibliography, one third is internet source. But of course, you have to read and interpret. So nothing is said in the English text. They say he led an incident, he fired the first shot, end the story. They hang him, execute him, and they execute the, um, the Jamada who refused, the, the um, soldier who refused to arrest him. So they hung two men. So his British sergeant came out to investigate the unrest. There was an unrest on the, in the barracks. And they shot at him. Now this is in all the books. And attacked him with a sword. That is there. That is history. He also shot at the adjutant. But he hit the, he hit the um, horse instead. Don't know if the horse died. I didn't read that part. After failing to incite his comrades into rebellion, because this is what he was doing, he says, hey guys, it's time to revolt against the British for all those reasons we saw, and some we'll see again. At his trial, Pandey wore his traditional dhoti instead of his sepoy uniform. When Gandhi's eyes opened after his English education and his maltreatment in South Africa, where they physically kicked him off a tree, throw him out and throw his luggage at him. Look at the movie Gandhi, it's in English. He decided, hey, something is wrong here, and I will change this. When Mandela was first arrested as a young man, and you have seen the, 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 uh, the movies and the documentaries, he put on his African wear and he walked the streets right, in chains, so that his people will see who he was, understand who he was, what he was fighting for, where he was coming from. And it's important for people to understand that sort of thing. In terms of, somebody had asked me, uh, why are you going to talk history? So I said, well, all right, you will come and listen to the lecture on Mauritius, <laughs> because I didn't want to explain, explain to him. Poor fella is not here, uh, I'll invite him again. Um, why could all this history help us in terms of economic development, political, social, and spiritual development? 
but I had to give him a lecture, I wish he was here, and would start thinking for himself afterwards. After failing to incite his comrades into open rebellion, and this is what Pandey was about, he tried to shoot himself, that is to commit suicide, as I said, and then he was hanged along with another sepoy who refused to arrest him. The guy who, um, the one man who stood up, and he must have been a corporal or a sergeant, who stood up with the British, was later murdered. Right? That is, he stood on the British side. The rest of the guys were wavering. What do we do? Because it was a, a little bit of a surprise, but these things are planned in front. Right? Gregory, my union partner, I have many questions to ask him about union organization and how would people organize to do something. You just don't go up and call up, go out and shoot the British commander. There's a plan, there's an idea, but they put him as a drunken comrade you know, at, that, at that day. So the Great Indian Mutiny broke out shortly after Pandey's execution for treachery. Right? So he was treacherous. That is, he wanted Indians to rule India. What's the treachery in that? What's the mutiny in that? Do you mutiny against your own self? If you want to free yourself and your people, is that wrong or is that right? So the sepoys in the other regiments, and sepoys, remember, come from the word sepahi, Uru coming from the Persian, meaning soldier. Sepahi, sepoy, the English converted into sepoy. Sounds like ninja turtle to me, but. Sepoys in the other regiments thought this punishment too harsh. And indeed it was. And sepoys and civilians would rise in rebellion. Pandey became the first martyr of the mutiny. And in 1857, this is late after Pandey, Muslim and Hindu troops in India rebelled against the rules that violated their religious tenets. Hart, who is at the University of Calgary, and I buy my books when I travel to these countries and I read them and I try to understand my own history. So here was the use of cow fat and pig fat in the gun cartridges which sparked off the mutiny. That is how it happened. The spark that lit on the, on the keg of a gun powder. So the Hindus, ran, the Hindus and Muslims ran the risk of defilement. The former, the Hindus, if the grease was from cows because the cow is sacred to the Hindus. And for the Muslims, if the grease was from pigs, because I think the, the pigs are considered unclean animals in that uh, culture. The first group of mutineers were the sepoys of the 19th Bengal Infantry at Berampur, who refused to use the cartridges for those reasons. This infantry and Mangal Pandey's infantry at Barakpur were the full, where the first shot was fired by Pandey who promptly disbanded me. They stripped them of their uniforms, they marched them in the air, marched them in chains, took off their uniforms, I guess they must have had enough pants alone or something, and humiliated them and walked them through the streets, past the jail, past the main city center and so on, and this happened in all parts of India. So the first major battle of the mutiny took place at Birampur, in the Murshidabad district, 120 miles from Calcutta, then the British capital of India. And I take pains to put where these cities are so we understand them. Uh, we'll have a map. But, yeah. The mutiny then spread, and I will spell out all these places because it's important, because when you check your list here of where you come from, you may find one of these villages. And as I go, around, go along, I'll ex ex explain. So my great-grandfather came from Gazipur, which was near to where Pandey had lived. And when the Indian soldiers went back to Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, they started their own revolts there, 800 miles away from Calcutta. And that is where most of the people came from, to Trinidad, to the West Indies, and to Mauritius. So the mutiny spread to Dhaka, Chittagong, Jalpaiguri, Silhet, and Agartala in Bengal in solidarity with the revolts in North India. 
So in there was a fire. While it started as a sepoy mutiny, it soon engulfed the peasantry and other populations. As I said before, disgruntled sepoys who were disbanded from the army returned to their homes in Awad and Bihar. You'll see Awad, Oud, O U D H. That is where Oud is where Lord Rama was born in India. Oud. So it's an important area for the Indians. Bihar is right next door, adjacent. So they went home with a desire for revenge and they joined in the mutiny back in their, in their own area. Across India, the mutineers were joined by local chiefs, takuldars, that is landowners and so on, big men, pundits and fakirs, the common man, princes and politicians. We go to Mirut now, where the large revolt, you have to call it, that started. At Mirut, a garrison town 40 miles northeast of Delhi, 85 sepoys were jailed for refusing the cartridges. They were sentenced to imprisonment some up to 10 years. The next day, the Bengal regiments broke into revolt across Bengal. And as I say, Bengal is a large area encompassing many states from Bengal right up to Uttar Pradesh. And the mutineers cried, brothers, Hindus and Muslims, east and join us. We are going to a religious war. The sepoys massacred their British officers, the women, the children, other civilians. Eurasians, that is mixed English, European and Indian, were not spared. The mutineers broke their jail. In fact, 40 jails and more were broken throughout India, and everybody was free. Right? So murderers, mutineers, the whole gang, looters, thieves, bandits, they all also came on ships, mind you. Telegraph wires were cut, outbreaks followed in many cities, Delhi, Firozpur, Bombay, Aligarh, Mainpuri, Itawa, Bulunsha, Nasirabad, Moradabad, and many other places where our people came from. I will go through Delhi very quickly because although it's five, six slides are just in the interest of time. So the revolt spread to Delhi and other places there, Banaras, Allahabad, and Kanpur. Kanpur is where my great grandfather on my father's side came from in the 1880s, here at the Paris estate. We don't know the story. The story on my mother's side of my great grandfather coming from India. It's still in my mind because she told me that since I was a little child, repeatedly. And when I was a big man and I read about this revolt, I asked him, but why didn't they fight? So he said, they had encased their swords, remember it was mud huts. They had put the swords into the mud huts, plastered it. Poor fellas forgot to take it out and tell him. So I am here to say what they did. So there was much muttering, oh, when they announced at this infantry parade that Mangal Pandey had been executed in Barakpur and his regiment disbanded, they did that, and I found it in the text, they did that, in my view, very deliberately to suppress the real. And to tell them, hey guys, Pandey is dead, and so you'll be. This produced muttering in the ranks. Later the next morning, the rebels from Beirut arrived. They came to Delhi, which was the Mughal capital, and the native inf infantry regiments revolted. From Delhi it spread, and I'll go quickly through this slides, you all just choose what you want. In Delhi, they went to the Red Fort. I've seen the Red Fort, it's a beautiful building. I've seen the Parliament buildings, I've spent a few days here. They went and they called on Bahadur Shah Zafar the second the last of the Mughal emperors, then made merely king of Delhi by the British. They proclaimed him emperor of Hindustan, that is Indian, Indian emperor. And they now had the political sanctity to fight for their king. This is what the British say, we fight for God and king. Now they were fighting for God and the king, Indian God. Zafar appealed to a broad range of Indian social groups to unite in the mutiny, 
and his money, he put out a manifesto which you wouldn't find in books, but I have found it in one of the British books. And he called on pundits and fakirs to present themselves to me and take their share in the holy war. Zafar called for the overthrow of the British, whom he accused of, and we saw some of this before, taxes, excessive taxes, excluding Indian merchants from trade, displacing the products of Indian artisans, like the cotton weavers, and so on. They died by thousands on the roadsides in the villages of India. Right? And Manchester became rich and monopolizing all the posts of dignity and embodiment in the civil service and in the armed forces, as we saw before. Ten regiments of the cavalry. Cavalry is the horse soldiers. Fifteen regiments of the infantry, foot soldiers, rebelled and made their way to Delhi. The slaughtered company officers, the mutineers ran among, killing every European they could find, looting bazaars, that's the markets and so on, the cities, burning houses, and they were joined by the lo local people. The sepoys conquered Delhi, drove the British out, and declared India independent. That's very important. This is what they sought to do, and they were trying to do. And then General Bat Khan came, and he took over, became, becoming the de facto, de facto uh, ruler of the army, the general of the army, the Indian army. And so the news of the rebellion spread like wildfire throughout India. Right? And again, I mentioned the major areas, mutinies all over the place. And then the British troops were reinforced because remember they ruled the world. Right? So they had armies all over the place. Mauritius, India, Burma. They were fighting the Crimean War next to Russia. And the Crim soldiers from there came across to fight. And then of course they had their great Indian allies. The Sikhs, right next door to Uttar Pradesh, fought on the side of the British. They took part in all these all this slaughter and plunder of the Uttar Pradesh people and the Uttari people. The Gurkhas from the north, the forests of the poor in there, joined the soldiery and they got their three dollars instead of one dollar of nothing to eat. And they slaughtered from Delhi to Lucknow all over the place on the side of the British. This has some statistics. 1,700 right? uh, medals. In those days, one cent for a medal. Good. In the large, in our companies, Gregory, was 50 cents when we were there. <laughs> in UBOT times. 50 cents for a medal for loyalty. The Times of London, and this is a big newspaper, and remember when you read the newspaper, Professor, Dr. Jerome will talk to you about that too, in Trinidad, because he's written all those things. These fellows interpreted how they wish to interpret it on behalf of their interest, which is capitalist interest, big money interest. Who owns the newspapers? Not me and you. So the Times of London had stated in 18, since 1855, two years before the revolt, we have conquered India and by British hands, by British hands, and by them it must be retained, as if it was something God given. Queen Victoria gave an amnesty to mutineers and some people were transported, just like they would transport prisoners from uh, England to Australia, to the West Indies here, they transported them as well, the Englishmen and the Irishmen and Scotsmen and to America. They transported, so it's a transport. <coughs> but what happened really is they started to use the indentureship ship system instead. And we'll see some men are transported here to Belize. 1,000 soldiers, their wives and children, amounting maybe to a total of 3,000, 4,000, were transported, put on ships, and sent to Belize. When I went to Belize, I, when I go to these countries, I do the research in the countries and in their books. And I discover that there is nothing written about it at all. So that's a map of the world. There you see in there. On, the, on my left, extreme left, Calcutta in the north, Madras in the south, and from there, those two areas, and Bombay as well, to some extent. Ships came to Mauritius, that's Mauritius, 
We have been twice and I'm writing my PhD thesis on Trinidad and Mauritius, the wider Caribbean. Here is Trinidad, 11,000 miles plus. Some say 13,000 miles. I have to take my trail and check it like my geography teacher told me. Here is Belize up here, 1,000 mutineers transported like convicts there. And Trinidad asks for 10,000 convicts. Jamaica asks for 10,000. Guyana asks for 30,000 transportees, which is the same as convict. Grenada asks for some uh, 1,000, I think, gentlemen. This is the actual ship. This is a photograph of a ship on which my maternal great grandfather came to Trinidad. So I found it in a book. And by the way, you could find the case of your ship, the ships that your people came on, in uh, Basil Dubok. Right? He wrote on uh, oil traders and coolie something ships, coolie ships, oil traders and coolie ships. It's available at the library. Everybody could get a picture of the thing. This is a little bit blurred, but this is the actual emigration certificate. Uh, Simon is will be especially interested in this, of my great grandfather who came to Mount Pleasant. I have details a little bit later on, but in the interest of time, we move on. He came from, as you see, Gazipur. Gazipur, which was a place of revolt. Uh, Mangal Pandey lived nearby. So we move on to the Indian emigration, and I'll move through this very, very quickly. Indian indentured laborers supplied much of the cheap labor for the British Imperial economy. That's why we brought in man and vice, both of them, to work for the British. And between the 1820s, 1920s, close to 2 million Indians, and my belief is much more than that, because in all the thing, history is not yet documented, moved all over the world. By the end of the colonial period, realized by independence, Probably four million people from India became or settled overseas. That's from Bates, Carter and Bates who writes about Mauritius and, um, and the East Indian, the Indian diaspora. I don't use the word East Indian because East is wrong. Our people came from India, not from East India. When I was 13 and 14 years old and then we have East Indian, I look at the map because my parents hadn't sufficiently taught me. And I said, well, wait, this is where, I, where we come from, the East Indies. We came from India, not the East Indies. But they use it for different historical reasons to separate East and West. But Indians came from India, not from East India. Guyana saw the first Demerara and Guyana, same place. 396 people in 1838, about one-thirds of them died. They shut down the indentiture system, and then they reopened in 1845. And between 1845 and 1848, 22,000 left for BG, British Guyana, Jamaica, and Trinidad. In 1853-54, 14,000 plus left. This is a picture, and I took it from the Bates article on the internet. Look at the mountain here. That's how Mauritius is. It's a jagged volcanic mountain, jagged peaks. A little bit frightening at times, but look at what the guys are doing for the Indians and Africans. And by the way, Indians went as slaves to Mauritius, to Malaya, to Reunion. In Mauritius, 6,000 Indians were sent by the French as slaves. When the British came, guys, convicts and so on went as well. But 6,000 Indians were slaves in Mauritius, and this is how they cut the land. And you could imagine that is San Fernando Hill and the cutting down and planting. All here was sugar. Paradise here was a slave estate. Yeah? Sugar estate. Born chagrin, laser for palmies, you name it, going down the coast. The sea was the road. From here straight down to Cedras had sugar estates, which closed down after emancipation. But you come to my next lecture and listen to that. So this is how my great grandfathers are here, your great grandfathers. Right? My African brothers as well, the same thing. Cut down the land for the British. Plan key, make money, profits go to England. I think this morning I heard somebody say on the TV in one of the interviews, the French and the British didn't educate their children here. They educated them in England and France. And how do you think they did that? 
we doing that now and we show our noses we paying for education and all. They did it out of the toy of the Africans and Indians. The they didn't send their children to schools here. They sent them to Europe. This is women sugar workers in the industry. Always remember the women. In my studies of indentureship, I think the women seem to have been more stronger than the men. Men were dead by the time they were 40 years old of diseases including hoko and so on. And the women kept us alive. Strong men, we praise them. Transportation, as I said, overseas, this is for the convicts. The British could not keep these guys in India. It was too difficult. As I said, 40 jails were broken. Um, the people who were freed and so on, the rebels and so on, would have numbered over 100,000, maybe 500,000. One uh, writer has said 20 million people were displaced and dislocated. India is a big place, as we saw. 90 or 100 million at that time. And this revolt happened all over India. So they were sent to the Andaman Islands, where they developed. They had to do the same thing, cut down the, the things, build churches and schools and so on. And that is what they did. Sepoys were banished across the Kalapan, the Black Water. We'll talk about that in the next lecture. To avoid a compulsory trip to Port Blair. Others ended up in other colonies, including the British West Indies. We have to do the research on that. I don't know how many. It's important to look at this. The Awad ruler, remember I said he was from Awad or Kuku, in Uttar Pradesh. It was characteristic, taken from an English book of the evangelical era, that Wajid Ali, the king, was deposed on the grounds that he was excessively debauched, that he was of immoral character, drinking wine only and song, as they say, had him debauched. He was exiled to Bhomanipur, Calcutta, where the Indian depot, the depot in Calcutta, depots in Calcutta are placed. And he was placed upriver. And the Indians in the depot complained that he he doing all kinds of things and that nasty water coming down and they had to drink that and be it. There's something sinister about putting him there. I do not know what it is, but I have my good friend here, Sat, who's traveled to India, studied in India, written about him there. He will be talking to you at Christmas time, uh, the first Thursday in Christmas, on Christmas in India and Trinidad and Tobago. We look forward to seeing you all at that time. So he was left with his mistresses to while his time away. And the British accused them of having too many mistresses. But as I say, when they came, they took many mistresses themselves. And, you know, they talk about populating Trinidad. And when the guy from Point Fortin came here, I am from Point Fortin, Mr. Fortin, who, which he placed his name after, had 80 wives and many children. So he tried to populate Trinidad for himself. <laughs> all of his own accord. And that is what happened on all the estates. The fellas didn't have time to set up church and school. When Morton came, he did that course. Great man, great missionary, great visionary, as I will say in my next lecture. So different things happened. The sepoys went across the seas. They came here. They became destitute, and that is poor. So from $3 a day to zero, wives started. Mother starving, father, if he's still alive, starving, children cry. They want food. And this is how they decided to come here. So they emigrated. Vivek is a very recent book on, on Mauritius. Um, it was given that by a friend from Mauritius when I attended a lecture in Surinam. Um, by the way, I do these lectures abroad, and I thought it's time to do some in Trinidad. And, Blood and Jerome and Sat and so many other people are here with us. Again, I'm repeating here, but it's important. Shahabad, Patna, Gaya in Bihar, Uttar Pradesh. By 1860, there were over 300,000 Indians in Mauritius from 100,000. Shahabad, which was a place where the soldiers lived, gave emigrants right down to 1970. Something sinister. That is, you're punishing people for decades, right? 
if you read the 1917 ship records, you will see that. So very dramatic increases, a huge leap. Luke Lai, by the way, took five years to write his book on Chinese and Indian immigrants. It's the only record of Chinese immigrants. The, I mean, the records of Indian immigrants are very dispersed. Some of them very old. Some of them written almost like Britishers rather than uh, fathers from the university. <laughs> With due respect to my very good friend, <laughs> after they see the right a bit differently. <laughs> Just a joke. <laughs> So we had these huge leaps in, the, in emigration, Mauritius, Demerara, Trinidad, and even the Danish colony of St. Croix received one ship. They say a shipload, I have a little problem with that. That's just like the Baigan and the Cucumber we saw in the pictures. One ship of Indians. Geo Gigan, who is a British uh, writer at the time of emigration, said all these figures, I will go through them very quickly. 45,838 emigrated to Mauritius, Fiji, Trinidad, Grenada, and so on, and it increased over time. Came from the same districts, Shahabad, Gazipur. This one is very interesting, not written anywhere except in these two books, and I made it my duty to quote the books because nobody has written about this. Parliament transported a thousand sepoy mutineers and their families to British Honduras in 1858. That comes from Kega, C-A-I-G-A, and this was more to solve Britain's governmental problems, that is, in India, than the labor problem in forestry. And I've written on uh, Belize, I've been to Belize, British Honduras, and there the slaves were engaged in forestry, not sure. Then the Indians came and they put them into forestry. Poor fellows, they were there for thousands of years in India. As you see in the pictures, most of the forests were cut down. So they didn't know how to handle this forestry thing. They ran off. The wild Indians eat them, I understand. Some went to Belize, the capital. They had the Jose and then the Jose get mashed up in there, and the seas and whatnot, and by the seashore. And the hurricane, the hurricanes come in and mash up that land. So as I said earlier, British BG wanted 30,000. St. Vincent wanted a couple thousand. I've been to St. Vincent and I've checked the records in the archives, very good archives. Eight ships, 2,523 Indians. Some of us leave out the Madras ship and so on, but I checked it myself manually. And so it goes, thousands of Indians coming, rising to over 1,500 to 2,000 between 1851 and 1861. As I showed you in the pictures, this is a time that they cut down all the forests, this was forest, there were monkeys and caribs and caribs in Carib Street is named after them. They killed them all. The, the, uh, the Spanish conquistadors, they came here into the Gulf with Columbus, came back and killed them. In Hispaniola, he said he killed 40,000 uh, Amerindians, native Indians, in one battle. What a lie. He may have 40 of 400 butchers, you couldn't kill so many men in one day. Right? In Kanpur, they hired butchers to kill the white people. Sorry, part of our history, but that is all that. And then there were reports, as we see at the bottom of the slide, of sepoys coming to Trinidad in the Busi Palace, 1858, and an alleged mutiny on the plasma den, which went to Guyana, 1862. Well, the fellas mutiny, would you believe, is the only mutiny happened on 300, well, 320 ships came to Trinidad. More than a thousand came to the West Indies. 400 457,592 Indians came to Trinidad. Tika Singh has recorded in his book. He was at university when I was at university 40 years ago. He's now published after 40 years using further uh, statistics from the archives in Canada. To arrive there. And what did the guys on the plasma then mutiny for? They wanted more opium. They wanted to smoke. Right? Ganja came from India as well. I, I wouldn't talk on legalization today. So, immigrants, I repeat a bit, but you all have seen that. Mauritius reserve, uh, received most of the people. It shows you there again the cities and the places 
Norma vai norma, each year. And then you have the displacement, as I said. They planted opium. Dr. Sam Balcarancy introduced me to a book called A Sea of Poppies on Mauritius. I cried when I read that. And so what they did to our great grandparents. So they took away the lands, right? The British took away the estates and so on. They made them plant poppy to produce opium for China. So they call in their narco stick at that time. Poppy to in opium to in to, um, China. And they fought wars over that as you'll see. Right? So the British were involved in that. Cotton and, pop and uh, opium were major crops. There is still a, a factory in Gazipur that produces the opium for medical reasons. Good reason to bring on the trailer. Indian immigration summaries, right? thousands and thousands came, Calcutta and so on. 1910, Mauritius stopped the, the Indian leadership because they had enough people. I'll give you the figure in a little while. Oh, here it is right there in the middle of the slide. Between 1834 and 1910, 451,776 Indians migrated to Mauritius. Half, maybe half, a million. Of course, some were not. Today they are 68% they are of the population. They are represented in the army, right? Where you have here 9% Indian. They are maybe 68 or, so, or more than that percent. I've seen the army, I've seen the soldiers, I've seen the, the um, policemen, I've taken pictures. And I mentioned earlier, and I put it in brackets, in 1800 there was many as 6,000 Indian slaves in Mauritius, the size of the number in Reunion, as well as in Malaya. When I spoke to an ex naps historian, he said, where are that from? So that's it there, and I found it in many books. Quickly, very, very quickly, slides. This is Grenada, again, where I did my own um, lectures and so on. 2,000, over 2,000 came in these seven years. You'll see it there. You have the deaths, 91 deaths on one ship out of 284. Some people have written stories and you think it was a joyride coming here. Look at that and tell me that's a joyride, right? On, it took 90 days from India to Grenada. 91 there more than that. And they would throw them overboard. They, said, they wrote all kinds of things. They said that in night time they would throw them. The people slept on the floor like this with paddle, with um, rice bags. On the floor like this, men, women, and children. They wrote in later books, and uh, this may have happened in the steamers, they separated women and children. Early, early part it was a total disgrace. This gives you an idea. And this if these are individual lists that I'll check the records. You'll see Ara and Shahabad here, right? Shahabad, where plenty of people came from, 16 and 21 on the Jalawa, that's a ship, and the Countess of Ripon. So even these records show you here now in Trinidad, compared to the records of India. Where are these people coming from? They're coming from the areas of the museum. No doubt about it. Gazipur. In Cedras, it's full of people from Gazipur. Where Mangal Mang 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 Pandi come from, they don't tell me that. Luckily, I've known it. Uh, Azaribad, Janpur, Azamdar is somewhere here. It is Azamdar where Mangal Pandi was from. Where families in Rusina came from. Right? Then you have Purulia and Rachi. Rachi. And then Sahib Ganj of Gia in uh, Bihar. Look at this now, very quickly. Deaths on board the ships to Trinidad. The first ships in 1856, three of them, over 300 people. These ships were filthy, toilets were inadequate. Indians did not know how to use toilets, right? Some of them still do not know it in the countryside where I come from. There's a lot of free. <laughs> But they are sleeping policemen and gazette people all along the route. They didn't have latrines. You see it in the Indian movies. Right? When you go to the towns, Calcutta and so which you saw in the pictures I showed earlier. 
millions of people sleep on the road and they do their normal and so on, so on right there. One and two. <coughs> uh, these ships were filthy. Uh, people died because of the filthiness, because of the cholera. Cholera is caused by the germs you ingest. You drink in the water and so on, and the food you eat. Um, this is why many people died. They did not have the, um, uh, what you call it, the liquid uh, things for cholera and diarrhea, as we could buy in all the shops. And hundreds of people died on some ships. Is this all set there? So all set could be on the next one, I think. Is it? Let me just go back to the salt set. Salt set is where? Salt set. Salt set, yeah? 124 people died on that ship of 324. More than a man eating. Thrown overboard, the sharks eat them, and the sharks follow the ships straight to Trinidad just as they follow the slave ships. Indian passengers on the Rhine, I'll only read, I've done this, I have four pages of this. Anybody who wants to share that, I can share that. Ram Kilawan with my great grandfather, masculine, age 27, he was mature. They say he, um, he left uh, there because of Hindu Muslim rivalry. I do not know. Ghazipur, Kurmi caste, I'm proud of that. Any man could be a Brahmin, any man could be a good and religious man. He just has to follow from Sunday school. And Sunday school of all religions is what I recommend to people. Ghazipur, Saipur, and he came to Mount Pleasant, Simon, where your people came for his part. Um, I have my cousin here, Ronald Balkaran, who did some research on it. I went to India to the place where I couldn't find anyone because um, finally, it's a summary. How many Indians came here? British Guyana, 238,909. That has to be checked. Trinidad, for sure, because T. Kassim worked in the archives for many years. We are glad that we have this book now. The book is available. Right? You will buy it and read it. Uh, Jamaica, that figure has to be checked. Some say 38,000. St. Lucia, over 4,500. Grenada, Supram said, um, yes, sir. Right. Supram sources below says 3,209. My checks says much more than that, a few hundred more. St. Vincent, I checked it myself in the archives, 2,523. Bailey is 3,000 question mark because of thousand sepoys and their families. So that must be 4,000. And then other people came from Jamaica and so on, the settlements that we've seen. There, Toledo and so on. Right? And so I'm finished. You could look at my bibliography and so on. I'm not taking uh, inordinately a long time. Mm -hmm. These are some of the books that you could read. Some, most, much of them not available yet. Look like Lager, Lager, who taught me at university. Wrote that book when I was at university in 1974. Then look at the internet sources up to date, which really helps you. In other words, you cannot say I don't know ministry. I don't know what the name means. As I went to Pagoda and I met a lady, Sharmili, I said the shy one. <laughs> so the next lady watching me and get back to me. I said, hey, the parents gave you such a lovely name, Sharmili. The shy one, shy, whatever, the coin, that would mean. <laughs> what does Sila mean? SW means C. Right? But it's Shiva in the Hindu religion. Lord Shiva. La of Chai. Lord of Lord Shiva. Sita is Rama's wife. Yeah? Luckily I've been brought up in the different religions and I went to many southern schools. Rada was in Capital Government School. Presbyterian Church was built opposite me when I was six years old. So I spent much of my years there. But I who have been invited. Those of you who wish to invite me to church, to village, to lecture, if you think this was good, let's hear, let's hear it before I introduce you. Thank you very much. Right, so we have the questions after Dr. General Toxin speaks. I will now introduce him. I had to read the inter in the internet <laughs> to get up to the facts. <laughs> I know him simply as my friend from Victor Hill Point. Uh, do a proper and thorough introduction. 
Dr. Jerome Piloxi is a lecturer in the Department of History at UWE St. Augustine. There, he focuses on many things, including labor history, Afro-Caribbean activists and intellectuals, Indo-Caribbean diaspora in North America, Pan-Africanism, race, gender, and ethnic relations, and the impact of carnival and calypso. At UE, he teaches courses in the Caribbean world to 1660, foundations of the Americas, Caribbean economic history, tells me he wants to come and do a lecture, I guess he'll confirm that now, <laughs> but this is what I'm studying. <coughs> and capitalism and slavery. His books include Caribbean Flavored Presbyterianism, Education as a Prescription for Socio-Political Development, 1868 to 2008. And A Voice to Enlighten and empower, a voice to, to enlighten and empower. And in this latter book, you'll find many of his speeches, including emancipation, many of his speeches, including emancipation, the East Indian presence in Trinidad and Tobago, fed societies and rum shop politicians, I was. Tertiary education. <laughs> so I pause between that before you think two words together. <laughs> Rum shop politicians and tertiary education. No ambassador, no one in between. Just a joke. Nice to make a little joke in between. And his many motivational speeches to school students. As I said, we met in point, and his principal, who is who is wrote very endearingly of in his book on, on fed materials. You will have to read the book to find out what he's watching to make sure. <laughs> right? Uh, that's the school that I went to, my alma mater, and when I was HR manager at Trinman, I gave back, I gave back events here, Donna. My little son is now a big man, I have tears of him, a little baby like this, following me to Citrus, listening to the Islands and so on. And I think that has worked for them. All three of them are university educated. All three of them came to Naparima College. I thank the principals and the church for that. My wife is here with me and she took me to church in those days because nowadays you'll find young fellas do really go to church. She took me to church. So, Dr. Kiloxing also reinitialized the International Men's Day, and several of you have the, the uh, documentations on the century. I sent it on to you. So as I said, I first met him when he came to Clifton Hill and we did Carrig Islands. He was a coordinator in Point Fortin College. Now Point Fortin Senior said, now Point Fortin East Academy. They changed the names, but don't change the performance. Poor thing, it has decreased over the years, horribly. And he wrote a booklet, which I have here, I guess he's brought it, on the Jahaji Massacre in San Fernando. So today we ask him to enlighten and to empower us as he revisits, revisits the Jose Massacre in 1884 in San Fernando. It is a great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Jerry. Do I have some fruits here? Yes, of course. Thank you. Thanks very much, Matt Raj. And I hope that Mrs. Rampal is still coming to church. <laughs> and, um, I want to thank my friends who I invited here, like Mr. Kevin Rakira, Mr. Piola, Mr. Ray Samuel, uh, Mr. Ronald Bola, and Sanka Singh, and a few others. You know, I know that Madhuraj did his wrong work too. So I want to thank you all. It is so important that we start this, this course <coughs> in San Fernando because a lot of the academic and intellectual folks are going to UV and call the speed. Nothing is usually done in Central, hardly ever in South. So I'm glad that you start this up and I hope that it grows, right? You see how during the 50s and 60s Eric Williams had developed the University of Woodford Square and made it into a gallery. And I hope that one day we can have something like that at Supper or even at Skinner Park, right? So it's very important that we do this. And 
I'm so glad that Madraj spoke about that Indian mutiny so that you will understand that when I'm talking about these Indians in the 1880s in Trinidad, they didn't just come out of the blue. They were not rebellious people and radical Indians just so. There was a development that occurred over the decades. In fact, during slavery, plantation owners in the Caribbean and in North America did not want Africans from certain parts of Africa because they felt that these Africans were too rebellious and radical. So it's very interesting that you mention certain districts and that you focus on that mutiny because there's some evidence to show that relatives of these Indians, right, some of their descendants came to Trinidad and took part in this Jose massacre, right, took part in these Jose processions. And this, this bloody episode, it has been given different names. Ramiji has called it the Jahaji massacre and he would have his annual walks as you all would know from Shagwanas to Monroe And we have other academics like Kelvin Singh who, have written, who has written about it. We have Sat Bhakaran Singh, he had it in his PhD thesis. We have Brindley Samaru, and Brindley Samaru a few years ago had a conference right here in Naprima talking about the, the Pussy. So we have people writing about it and we have activists who have talked about it and also tried to commemorate it. And today I'm, I'm going to reflect on that Jose massacre. I'm also going to reflect on the present, on 2018, because it is very relevant when you read about this tragedy, this bloody massacre, and you put it in the context of 2018, you realize that there's a similarity. Kelvin Singh described it as the most traumatic episode in the history of the Indian sector of Trinidad's population. And this event could be one of the greatest human tragedies in the working class in Trinidad Tobago in the 19th and the 20th century. The majority of these working class Indians came from the Sugar Estates. They were Indians during the internship. They were free Indians. And what is very interesting, only a minority of Muslims celebrate this Jose. Some of you are might know the history where this Jose is really remembering the grandsons of Prophet Muhammad who was killed in 632 AD. Shiites, Shias, the Sunnis, you all will know that history. And interestingly, TML and Astra do not endorse or approve of this whole thing because of the celebration and the drunkness. They have some imams who have outrightly tried to distance themselves and condemn the whole thing. And it's very interesting that the unity that was there in 1884 continues today. Mr. Rampa will tell you about Cedros. There are people from different sections of society, different ethnic groups taking part in the Cedros Jose. Sat will tell you about the St. James Jose. You wouldn't just see Indians, you will see a variety of people taking part and also helping building these Tajas. Kelvin Singh said that Hindus participated in the construction of the Tajas, the processions, the drumming, and the ritual mock battles. He also mentioned that working class Africans, descendants of ex-slaves once worked on the estates, were also part of these processions. They also helped build the Tajas. So I want you to remember now, we are talking about the 1880s. We are talking about a Muslim festival celebrated by a minority of Muslims. Hindus are taking part. Africans are taking part. And from the research, Chinese and Portuguese who were on the fringes of the estate also took part. The Chinese, as you all would know, would have their little stores, so they sell food. They would be selling material to their building tajas. So the Chinese shop makers were also making some money from building these tajas. 
and the Portuguese who were also involved in the small retail trade were also selling small items during this procession. So we have some Muslims, we have majority of Hindus, we have the Chinese, we have the Portuguese, we also have some Syrians who had to sell some of the materials, right? To help build these tajas. So why am I telling you all about these different ethnic groups? There was a sense of working class unity. Now you all will remember the recent talk about the 1%. You remember that talk? Where Anthony Bourdain, right, who recently killed himself, came down and he did an interview in Fort Spain. And that interview sent shockwaves and the trade unions was a big uproar on social media and they started to criticize the 1% as if we never knew the 1% existed. That 1% was never always there than the 1%. They came from the sugar plantation too. For those of you who know about the dentistship experience, the Portuguese, the Syrians, the Chinese, those people came here to work on the sugar estates. But they couldn't endure on the estates. Many left and became shopkeepers and businessmen. So they all came from that plantation. And in the 1880s, the colonial authorities, the elites, sensed that there was a sort of unity. They sensed there was a small semblance of unity. There wasn't any great unity. People were not hugging each other and embracing each other. There was a sense of unity, working class unity, that the colonial elites were concerned about. Some of you all would know about the British strategy of divide and rule. Keep them divided so that we can rule them better. That is why when the British saw the visions, the British didn't try to heal the visions between the Africans and the Indians. The British stood back and allowed those divisions because that kept them united. And during slavery was the same recipe. When the plantation owners obtained slaves, they didn't take slaves from the same tribe, you know. They took, trade, they took slaves from different tribes and different parts of Africa so that the slaves on one person's plantation couldn't speak the same language. So the tribal differences were there, the linguistic differences during slavery were there, and during the dictatorship it was there. Now during the Kose procession, you had Indians of different castes. You had the Brahmins. Chakshri, untouchables, all taking part in this procession. There was a sort of unity amongst the Indians, the Hindus, that also troubled the British. So you had racial unity, you had some religious unity, and this was troubling the British in the 1880s. And what made it even worse was there was some resistance amongst the Africans during the Kangole procession, 1881. 1883, 1884, there were clashes amongst the Africans and the police in Port of Spain. So the 1880s was a time of tension. That eruption on Thursday the 30th of October 1884 in San Fernando didn't happen in a vacuum. There were a number of events leading up to that explosion. So I want to put it in a proper context. What Mr. Ramford talked about, that Indian mutiny, was one of those events. There was always this tension. There was never any sort of stability in Trinidad. Now I also want you to remember some of the myths of Indian leadership. And one of the biggest myths was that Indians were passive and the Africans were radical and rebellious and always having riots and revolution and the Indians were the passive ones. So I'm very glad that you saw that mutiny and how serious it was when thousands were dying. Now this massacre that occurred at Monrepo and Cipero in San Fernando has been marginalized in Trinidad Tobago's history. A few years ago I asked the question, why are secondary school students and primary school students not studying the Jose Massacre? Why is it not on the CXC and CAME curriculum? 
why other Caribbean students don't know about this Jose massacre, <coughs> this Jahaji massacre. So it is marginalized. But you know what is so unfortunate? Is that sometimes some events are always there in the public memory. You notice the big trial allow we make in July for the coup? And they have these big interviews and they talk <coughs> about the coup. We tend to have a very short collective memory. We are very short-sighted when it comes to remembering events. Yes, we have Emancipation Day, we have Indentorship, we have the Baptist holiday. But some events we don't remember. Many of us don't know about the July 1934 is where thousands of Indians and the estates rioted and wanted better wages and working conditions. And July 1934 was the predecessor, the precursor to the famous 19th of June 1937. <coughs> Some of us, it is failing in our memory about the Black Power era. And our primary and secondary students don't know about the Black Power era. Some of our people don't even know about Bloody Tuesday in 1975 that occurred right here in San Fernando when trade unions were being. And that is so sad because Bloody Tuesday was that same clash between the police and the working class. It's a similar scenario that is so sad that is absent from our textbooks. So these processions, two processions headed to San Fernando, about 900 to 1,000 persons. These processions headed into San Fernando. Police forces are stationed at Point Pier and St. Joseph. <coughs> And newspaper reports indicate that at Monrepo and the Cipero entr entrances in San Fernando, persons were assigned to stop the Indians, to warn the Indians to stop the procession. There are people known as stipendary magistrates, there are shopkeepers from the reports, were told to warn the Indians to stop. People went out and read the riot act, and they didn't read it in English. They read it in Hindustani too, so the Indians would understand it. The Indians, some of you might call them stubborn, but they were so strong-willed, they were so determined to have their procession that they disregarded the advice from shopkeepers, yeah, you all would know about the justice of peace. All these people went out. Other Indians went out. The colonial authorities told these people go and warn those marchers that we will fire on them. So when Captain Baker went out with his forces and they had two ships out there in San Fernando in the sea waiting eh? so they were prepared, fully prepared for outdoors. They were fully prepared for some sort of rebellion. And these Indians were warned and they still continued on was Captain Baker told his men to give a warning, to give a warning, they knelt down and they fired. Eighteen persons were killed, eighteen Indians were killed, more than one hundred wounded, and they were sent to the Cooley Hospital, which is today known as the San Fernando General Hospital. And from the newspaper reports, and from the Norman Commission, which was released in 1885, you get an idea that these Indians were very rebellious and radical. These Indians challenged colonialism. So they were not just the typical Bajon Indians who say, I want to break the law because I am a Bajon. These Indians in a simple procession, was sending a message to the colonial authorities. So this was one of the early blows to colonialism. It was a major blow to imperialism because this Jose massacre made news in the British Empire. Just as the Indian mutiny circulated throughout the British Empire, this famous massacre that occurred right here in San Fernando which is marginalized in our history and forgotten almost, made history, it made news 
in the British Empire. And these people, we didn't have ambulances, very few cars at that time, and these people were just carted off. My branch told you all about the bison. They were just put on cars and sent off into the hospital, and they didn't have any proper medical facilities as we have today. And many of these persons who were wounded were Africans. Right? Many of those who were wounded were Africans who were in those processions. I gave you all a list that Dr. Ken Parmesan produced. He did research in India. And he, has, he has a PhD thesis, just like uh, Dr. Balkaran said, where they focused on the Pussy. And he came up with these 18 names. 18 names of Indians who were killed. And I also gave you all a few pages with the newspaper report from the San Fernando Gazette and the New Era. So you also have an idea to see how the newspapers, the daily, were reporting on the event. So it was a tragedy. It's a tragedy that could have been avoided, but it also shows the disrespect colonial authorities had for culture. It was a Philistine society Colonial authorities did not appreciate, did not respect the religion of these Indians and the cultures. You all will know simple things that we take for granted today, like cremation, could not have occurred during the colonial era. Now, what I want to ask you all, and what I want to challenge you all this evening, I don't expect Mr. Ramphal to do everything for his group of retirees, but I want to ask you all. Why? Why in San Fernando we do not have signs indicating where these two massacres occurred? I see signs all over Trinidad. I even see signs in Spanish now. I can't read Spanish. I can't read Spanish properly. My little Spanish from Sesame Street. I'm seeing signs in Spanish about turn here and this highway and take this left. And I'm seeing it wouldn't cost plenty to put up two signs to show where these two massacres occurred. Because many people don't know. Many people don't know where the massacres occurred. And they have rumors that, you know, it didn't occur there. It occurred in this spot. What I want to also ask, why we cannot put up a simple plaque with these 18 names? These people have been referred to as martyrs. And the word matter is a powerful word, you know. It means that you're dying for something. Why? I don't know, maybe the San Fernando Borough Corporation had financial difficulties. I don't know if they expect a wealthy businessman to find the money to put up a plan or to put up two signs. But yet, in San Fernando and South Trinidad, you all have such a rich history and remains hidden. It wouldn't take much, but you have to persist because the borough corporation will have you sitting and will ignore your petition. A simple letter to the editor will not be enough. A simple interview. But what I also want to ask you all, those 18 martyrs have been buried somewhere in San Fernando, and I do not know where, but I want to know where these 18 Indians were buried. I also want to know the names of some of these Africans who put their lives at risk at that procession. And those names are absent from the history books, absent in the archives. So this is why it is very important that we bring this back to 2018. We bring it back into the present. And you have to try to recover your history. It's very important. Mr. Ramphal talked about going in into the archives. Some of the information is absent from the archives. But some of us in San Fernando, some of, some of us will have great-grandparents who might have taken part in that procession. You might have had, you might have had a neighbor who might have had no somebody who took part in that procession, or you might have known somebody a great-grand-uncle or so who might have died 
amongst one of those 18 Indians. So I want you to understand, these Indians rebelled not just against colonialism and imperialism, they rebelled against wages, they were rebelling against bad working conditions, low hours. These Indians were rebelling against regulations. They were rebelling against a system that had marginalized them, that had made them inferior. This is how I want you to understand the context of the Jose massacre. It wasn't simply policemen gunning down and shooting these 18 Indians and, and wounding these other Indians and Africans. It's something that you must understand in a wider context. Now, Mr. Ramford mentioned Reverend John Morton, a Canadian missionary, who was the founder of the Presbyterian Church, and of course you all will know that they had the Scottish Presbyterian Church here also earlier. And John Mott testified before the Norman Commission, a famous commission. And listen to what Morton said, I quote, Nothing would have stopped the procession but actual force, and the firing was absolutely necessary. I think the government was quite right in issuing orders concerning the regulation of the Jose procession, end of quote. If you listen to Morton's testimony before the commission, you would realize that Morton is agreed with what Captain Baker and his soldiers did. He is supporting the government. But you have to remember why John Morton said that. John Morton and some, pre some Presbyterians were there, some Indians who were Anglicans and Catholics were also in that procession. Eh? Morton, who is a Canadian missionary, he is from that Eurocentric era where, if you look into the history books, he didn't fancy Islam and Hinduism too much. That was an era, 1870s, 1880s, when the Canadian mission was on a journey of conversion. So Morton had a problem with a procession that had drunkenness and that also was a minority Muslim festival and where he was seeing drunkenness party. But this was a very strict missionary. Yeah? So I want you to understand this was possibly one of the reasons why Morton would have told the commission that the government was correct in doing what they did. But even more importantly, why Morton made that testimony and why some missionaries also agreed what the government did was because the government helped fund the Canadian Mission Schools. It was known before as Canadian Mission Indian Schools, CMI School, CM School. Canada wasn't given enough money to support the pupil teachers and to build more schools and help the churches. But the colonial government, the British government, was providing financial resources. So it was necessary for Morton to go along with this farce, to go along with this game and to agree with what the government had did and had done. So I want you to remember that some of these Indians they were not just Hindus and minority were Muslims, but some of these Indians were recent converts. They had converted to Presbyterianism, they were Anglicans, they were Roman Catholics. And this also brought the government a little concerned because there was a sense of unity. So I wanted to understand, whenever there was unity, whenever there was this feeling and the working class was coming together, the British had to find a way to undermine this, to make sure that this unity would unravel. And this is how I want you to understand 1884. And you know what is so sad about 1884? It continues today in 2018 with the two major political parties. Because sometimes you will see events occurring. It could be trivial events, it could be major events. 
and it keeps the population divided. And no matter what we say or do, most of the population in the past and in 2020 will vote along racial and ethnic lines. It is one of the curses of party politics. So just as the government in 1884 wanted to keep the population divided, I want you to try to understand the politics of 2018, as I end, how a lot of times signals are sent out to try to keep the population divided. Whenever there's a sense of unity, certain people and certain incidents will occur to keep us divided, to keep us in our cocoons. So I'm talking about the event 134 years ago, eh? 1884, 134 years ago. In 2018, we have no visible evidence that this massacre occurred. It's as if it never occurred. And we still have, we no longer have the British forces. We now have the government, and those governments change. And those governments have come and gone and none of these governments felt the need that this Hosea massacre should be remembered in some way. No government has felt, you know what, I feel this should be something that should be taught. I feel that this is something that is very precious to the history of Trinidad and Tobago. Right, so I want you all to, as I end there, to remember these Indians, to remember this incident in 1884, in which simple, illiterate working class, some of them were semi-literate, working class Indians of different backgrounds were able to defy the mighty British Empire and send a powerful message. Send a message that 134 years ago, we still remember and we are still trying to interpret why would these Indians risk their lives? Now these Indians came from different estates. Don't believe they came from one estate. Some of these Indians only saw each other during Hosea and other celebrations. The Indians who died had families. They don't believe these were all bachelors. The gender barrier was also crossed. There were some women. Of course, the Hindu and Muslim women very conservative at that time, so many stayed in the barracks. But some of the women, so a gender barrier was being crossed too. Age barriers were crossed because children and teenagers were out there. So I want you to understand, 134 years ago, an incident occurred one Thursday afternoon. Gender, racial, ethnic, religious, age barriers, all being crossed, and the police carried out their duties under the guise, under the guise that this procession was something that could create trouble and that something was revolution. There was nothing revolutionary about it. For those of you who know about Jose, the Tajas would be thrown into the sea. Would have been thrown into Taruba Bay or the Karakara River. So there was nothing radical about it that threatened any of the colonial elites, but it sent a message, this message of defiance, because the Legislative Council, which is the Department, had passed regulations that this procession was not to occur, and that immigrants, descendants of immigrants, were not to take part, and those who were not on the estates, not to take part in this procession. So I want you to understand, a simple act of defiance was able to bring the mighty British Empire at least for a few moments to its knees, at least momentarily to its knees, and to send a message, to send a message that indentorship will not continue. Because a few decades after, by 1920, indentorship was completely gone. So I want you to, to think about this, to remember that incident that occurred 134 years ago, still influencing our lives, still affecting how we examine Indian history, how we examine the history of San Fernando. And I also want you to remember again how certain events have remained 
for Latin in the public memory. It has remained outside. Many of my students at UWE don't know about the Arena Massacre. They don't know about the Arena Massacre, which occurred when the Native Indians, the First Peoples, the Indigenous people, reacted violently to those missionaries. It is so sad that many of our young students cannot recall some of the slave protests and revolutions in Trinidad. They could tell you about other slave revolutions in the Caribbean, and they will tell you what happened in Burbies and Jamaica. They will tell you about slave leaders in the Caribbean. But they cannot tell you about a slave protest. And you know what is sadder? They cannot name any Indian leaders. They cannot tell you about the names of any estates that had riots. You know, that is so sad. And that is why sometimes we have people believing that indentureship was something that was peaceful and slavery was a violent era. You know, between 1882 and 1884, there were 25 strikes in Trinidad. 25 strikes, 1882, 1884. You ask anybody about the Indian leaders of some of these strikes, they don't know. And that, that shocks me, you know. How could university students in year two and year three, they are going to graduate with a certificate from UWE and they don't know their history. They know other countries' history. And they know American history very well too. They know American history. They, they even know American history ten times more than our history. And that is so sad. And I know that we have some of our academics and intellectuals trying to bring it back into the public. But it bothers me to stand up in front of a class and ask the class, what is the arena massacre? You know what is that? Some people don't even know where the arena massacre happened. And I have to be honest in my class who cannot tell me about a revolt in Tobago. As if the slavery era never occurred in Tobago. And that is so sad. I don't want to ask any of you all here, but make you all proud. <laughs> <laughs> but these are people who are walking with a university degree in history. Eh? They are passing my course. Right? They are passing my course because I don't want to create a big failure right? and I get fired and grab the UTT. But they are passing my course. And they're going out there. They get a job or they're migrating and they don't know about these important events. And I just bring up in one of the classes about the Hosea Massacre and they ask me if it is a recent event. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very, very surprised, you know. I'm very sad about this. You know, it, it bothers me and I don't believe that we can write a lot of history books because we'll just end up in the Dallas Library. But if you all could put up those plaques and you all put up those monuments, the public will see these things and try to remember it or try to find out about it. And you know, right now in 2018, we are very passive people. You know. We are very passive. And I say that with, with, uh, with no fear that we, we take on all these problems in Trinidad, like the flood, we take on the crime. And you see, you all might find 18 Indians being murdered in 1884, a small number, because you know why? Right now, we have more than 300 of our citizens who have been murdered. And the count is 344, 334. And for the last five years, almost 400 Trinidadians and Tobagoans have been murdered. We have an annual murder rate of almost 400 people being murdered. So when you come here, just 18 persons in 1884, that is insignificant. Why would the population of San Fernando, it's like, why would we want to mention or remember 18? Eh? This year, the year didn't finish as yet. And we have more than 300 persons violently killed, violently murdered, and for the last five to eight years, almost 400 citizens every year murdered. So that is why. Why would we want to find about who was killed in a slave revolt? 
or a revolution. You understand me, you When there are so many people being murdered. So I want you to remember that. We have become desensitized. It's not just passive people. There's a certain amount of empathy. You don't care about your history. You don't care about your culture. You don't care about your identity. This is part of your identity. This is part of the identity of South Trinidad, of San Fernando, of Trinidad and Tobago. And we just don't care. You just don't care. I, I want to end on a positive note uh, to thank Mr. Ramphal for inviting me. And I know that he has a, a series of lectures, right, to be the next one, that will help enlighten uh, Trinidad and Tobago and San Fernando. And I want him to see if he could get this recorded, at least put it on YouTube, we have the social media platforms, right? We sometimes abuse. That we try to educate public because it's a, it's a sadness, it's a sad state of affairs when I consider that we don't know our history. I have spoken to people in San Fernando about their history. And they are so limited. You know what conversation ends up being talking about? San Fernando West and San Fernando East. <laughs> about the marginal seats in San Fernando West, right? That is how it is limited, you know. We are not talking about our politics. We are not talking about San Fernando West and San Fernando East. And I am just shocked. I say you have a history that is so rich. It is almost as rich as Paul has made. And you do not know your history. You do not appreciate your history. And you all need to find a way to make sure that that history comes alive and stays alive. I thank you all for attending. Yeah. I don't know if I could take a few questions. Yeah. Yeah. You talked about uh, some kind of memorabilia for the massacre. Maybe one could approach the arts groups around. Because I remember some years ago, but I've, I've been the secretary of the San Fernando Arts Council some time ago. And under the leadership of Terence Mohammed, we used to have an, a reenactment at by the Monaco police station there. Right. And then it just died out. So it could be revived. Uh, revive so, it. Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Revive it. Right? The, the need for the younger generation to continue these events is so important because as the older generation dies out, these events die out. Yeah. Right? And you mentioned something that is so important because I have said in the past that even events like Best Village and the Secondary School Drama Festival should have these things as plays. We have the Film Festival, and I want to challenge Mr. Nivella to produce maybe a documentary. We could produce a documentary, we could produce a movie on the Jose Massacre or on some of these historical events. The amount of, I want to call it garbage, that I see being sometimes performed in Port of Spain and Cyprian in Labour College and Sapa, I say that Fast. our people are so talented. Fast. Our people are so talented, we could have these plays, these skits, and have our history being produced there, right? So that reenactment is so important that you talk about, and I'm glad you brought it up here today. I hope that somebody decides to take up the challenge because it's not just a reenactment, but the drama. We have talented people, right? We have James Lieber, we have Ralph Brandt, and we have a host of other people from San Fernando. A lot of creativity, a lot of gifted minds, talented people, and we need to try to bring that history alive, right, through some of these matters. Any more questions or comments? Yeah, David. Well, David and Lisa. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is David Maharaj. Uh, only a few comments on Gerald's um, presentation. The first one is that you must applaud Gerald. He wrote a play on the Jose Massacre. It is called Murderers in Uniform. <laughs> and uh, for many years I've been trying uh, reproductions to get it on, and they promised me to do it. So he has made a very important step in preserving the Muslim massacre. Okay? So congrats. You're not from South, but you're okay. 
Now, some points I want to raise about the massacre because I have done a very simple. Now, this list is wrong for two reasons. The number is wrong, it's 22. And not all of the persons died at Monarico. This list has some of the persons who died at Sipero Street. Now, let me tell you where the places are. In Monarico, it's where the bus stop is. It's not where the police station is. Ravigi has been, I've spoken already, that's the wrong spot. It is where the bus stop is. And in Sipero, it's where Scotia Bank is. Okay? Now, I, you could work out from this list who died where. Because the person from Union, they came from Monrico side. Cooper Grange came from Sipero side. Jordan Hill could come from Idaho. So Ben Venue, right? It's on Lara Main. So they would come that way. So I worked out where they actually would have come from. So it's roughly 9 and 9. Now talking about the plaques, I have written to the corporation about 10 years in a row about the plaques. In fact, I have, I have designed the plaques and have the names of these people on the plaques. And since the days of Marlene Kudre, I have been writing myself and testimony that I have to look at the Afro there. Right? <laughs> Always, is it right? Always, the wrong subconstituency. No. Always at Chutrini, eh? That was my neighbor. He has every race in it. Indian, <laughs> African, Indian, Chinese, European. So he's our, he's our real tree. Okay? So we have tried, eh? Uh, keep on trying. We had a San Fernando Heritage Committee, yeah. and that imploded. Uh, can't be right and right. But again, you know, I want, and people must drive past. The bank, I wrote the bank, you know, Scotia Bank, and after the blah blah blah, they never replied. I wrote some people in, in um, on repo, no, no response. But people, please know where these spots are. And when, when you're driving past, they say, I said that for it. And we also must thank Mongol Chapter Go. Mongol deceased. Mongol used to do a play, a yes. street theater, yeah. under the Arts Council. Yes. Right? For many years he did it. Mm -hmm. And he used to do it. Uh, again, he used to start the roundabout and he used to walk in San Fernando. Mm -hmm. In the Arts Council building on Circular Road, yeah. there's a mural that commemorates the massacre. On the wall, yeah. On the wall, yeah. So I just want to add my two bits to the Okay, thank you. Thank you. Before, before Sal says something, I'm glad David mentioned the numbers because <laughs> Kelvin Singh had said 16. Parmesan said 18, 18. David said 22, so the number might go up. In the next few years, we're going to get the picture. 22 is in 22, right? And, uh, the end of history. The end of history. <laughs> Interestingly, the government report said 12. So they tried to keep it down, minimize it. They said 12. Right? So I'm glad that I didn't know that David had clocks and numbers ready. So yeah, yeah. Just, he's just waiting now for a proper prime minister. MP now to just go with it, right? Oh, no, sir. Okay, sir, first and then. Thanks, I think. I want to make some comments first and then indicate. The, the massacre with, with um, Hussein was 680. That's when Mohammed didn't sell it. That's all right. You're right. That's one. The other thing, I think it's, it's an excellent presentation, but Hussein is not a festival. And I think we have to be very careful about that. Hussein is a commemoration. So we are commemorating the death of, of the martyrs, the grandsons, right? So we got to leave out the word festival, right? Um, Islam. Islam didn't come to Trinidad with India. Islam came to Trinidad with the Americans. 1814-15. We know the recorded history of Islam. It could have been, yes, the man But you see, the Americans 
were part of the Mandingos. But they went to America, they fought, they came to Trinidad, and they pursued Islam. But they were not part of the, the companies. They set up another establishment in Turin, in San Riven. And the lands were cut for them by the Caribs there in the region. So that's history, right? Um, one, the problem which we say of Muharram is a Shiite and a, a Sunni affair. And the Muslims in Trinidad, the majority are Sunnis, right? So there will be Bora, there will be Khwajas, there will be Ahmadiyyas, there were Sunnis, they, they are there. Yeah. And some came also as um, other sects. Very, very few came as Shia. So they didn't want this Shia commemoration. Another thing, when Jose came to Trinidad, it came as an Indian thing. It was not a Muslim thing. Right? Because the whole of India take part, used to take part, continues to take part in Muharram. Right? The, the big break took place in 1905 in India when the British ran a schism and divided Shia and, and, um, and, and Sunni because of political reasons. So we, you know, um, we need to understand that it was an Indian thing here. And since Africans were already part of Islam, it became part of it. The third one, um, they will say massacre took place for the right to cultural self-determination. And I think we need to stress that. It was cultural self-determination. And um, Morton's view. Morton's view, 1868, Morton had come here to claim people's souls. So it was in his best interest to divide Indians, Muslims and Hindus. It is only after that, if you look at the numbers in his church, you would see the numbers rose because he had divided Muslims from Hindus in terms of his church after 18 years. And oh, 18, 18, the last thing I, I wanted to indicate with respect to that, um, you talked about the Arenales massacre of 1699. Right. That's where San Grande got its name. Because they started running from Arenales. They ran through San Grande. There was another big blood. And then they ran into Tukwan and, and the, the Amerindians jumped over it too. Nobody, nobody talks about that in Trinidad at all. In, instead of having the Spaniards capture them, they committed suicide. I've been working on this since 1991. I've gone back to India. I've got photographs, where it started, how it started, the areas of luck now. Time with Mansarge's War of Independence, right? And um, I've written a whole ballet on it. The ballet is just a line. Uh, no money to, to, to run. I have been approached last year to do a documentary, but I felt there was need to do something dramatic before you can document the thing. Otherwise, it would just be talking. So um, these are some of the, the issues I wanted to raise with respect to this. And in terms of Manfred, I don't know if you're allowed me to. In terms of this, Manfred. Uh, yeah, refreshments up here. Yeah, I mean, it's long. Okay, refreshments if you all wish to come up and have it. Right. Um, Manfred. You go right there. I want, Awad and Ud are the same names, right? Where I was born, 
is in a yod here which is in oven. Right? And um, two after the mutiny, since the British, since the mutinous had captured and controlled Delhi, after the British got hold back of India, it took them two years to kill 200,000 people in Delhi to re-establish their control. That's history. Um, so I think we need to understand that. 1856, Wajid Ali Shah, who was then the Nawab of Awad, which is today Uttar Pradesh, he was exiled into Calcutta. But he didn't go with his harem. He went with his whole entourage. So there, there was a whole village, a whole establishment that went. Okay. And uh, there is a lot written on it, how he continued playing Tassa, continued um, the commemoration of Moharam in, in Calcutta. So I think that's very important to understand. Now the British said, he was only a debauch. But he wanted to improve the administration of our, he wanted to, to improve the military in our, but the British controlled the military. And he was a patron of the arts. He was the man who promoted Kathak. He was a Kathak dancer himself. So that they didn't want a man who could have controlled again through the arts, through the military, and through the, the, the administration. So they said he was debauched. And that is what is written. But today, there's so much being written otherwise, that um, is showing otherwise. Um, well, I think we, we spoke about the exile of the 1002. British Honduras and a thousand went from Jamaica. To Jamaica? Went from Jamaica to after in their British Honduras. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Today the population is 14,000. Strange. I, I, that information I got was. So, Dr. Anthony, would you then inform us exactly where the massacre of this arena? Where it is? Is it Brazil village or is it that? San Rafael. San Rafael. So then we are now in war. Yeah. Because Dr. Tillerson challenged us and nobody dared see. It was in San Rafael. So how far is Brazil from San Rafael? Is it on the border? It had to do with the church and uh -huh. the river. Uh -huh. Because they killed the, the, the people and they threw them in the river. Right. Which is going to the church. Right. Right. So what is it? It's not within Brazil village? Or it's just on the border? Where is the church? I have mine. Okay. Okay. Right? Near the right. police station on okay. the other side. Okay, no, I don't. So it's not exactly this one thing. One more thing. In 1637, if we don't know Tobago history, the Dutch were camping, I'm not a historian, but I'm not reading. Really. The Dutch were camping in Tobago. Right? And the Nipoyo chief Ayurima went to Tobago, negotiated with the Dutch, and they came and they burnt St. Joseph in 1637, on the 14th of October. And that's why the Santa Rosa Carib community last year had a holiday on that date. So there is a bit of Tobago history into that. Yeah. So I can leave it back to you. What you said is very interesting. There's one particular aspect of what you said. What do you call it? Yes. This year, the question came to us every day. And I thought it was just going to be very interesting. For example, we came here on. We were here on the 6th of January, 
destroy their seat of learning, their seats of learning, their books. My, my research in India has shown of the 147,000 Indians who came to Trinidad, 18 languages came here. They were not an illiterate people. They bought epics. They were doing, they were doing Ramila which is an epic 24,000 verses of a 10 day period. Nobody else has done since then up to now. All I am saying is the Indians were not illiterate. They didn't know English. Are you saying that people who have not come here and have done that kind of work and grant as well? There's a possibility that I am not disputing the fact that he came for literacy. I am saying, do not say that the Indians were illiterate. That's what I'm saying. And you must remember, what you were illiterate as far as the in the context of the language here, in the context of the customs here, and so on. Remember, there were people who came there, they were totally uh, they had their own customs, uh, their own language, and no know and so on, outside of the given yeah. scenario. So in that sense, you can say they were outside the present system. When you're outside the present system, I suppose that is a sense of intimacy. Thank you. I don't know. Um, but the same token, the British were deliberate about Indian customs. But I think it's important. Um, I have a a book I wrote, Shaping of a Culture. I think you should get a copy of that. Sorry. If I may. Yeah. See, I can, see a point he's making? It's fundamental. I tell you what. Remember, when they are in the years, you interrupt a people's process. What? What I'm saying, having been brought here, Morton was a, a representative, I'll say. Essentially what I'm saying, and I'm just debating, I'm not yeah, taking a yeah. position on this. Who's to say absent Morton? That those same people would not have re-entered history on their own terms, I repeat. Who's to say, because the point is, before the Mortons and the British, there's a heritage going back, Thousands of years. Right. So I'm suggesting the definition, and this is why there's a discussion. We tend to take the definition of literacy in Eurocentric terms. So in other words, had Morton not come, we would have defined such people, quote unquote, are uncultured, unliterate. No, no, the thing is, it's the same, it's the same. What you can say is that this exists, this still exists. Because this exists because Morton and his kind interrupted the process. Interrupted? And changed the process. You remember, you are talking about Presbyterians coming in from, from Scotland. Coming to Canada, being brought to Trinidad, but you know what was not Morton's major private investments? Coco. Look at the economics, and you see he made all his money in getting the Indians to plant Coco. Yeah, no, but then, yeah, no, these we can delay for long. I'm not saying we dispense with that. I think so. Yeah. I invite you two guys to let us, I 
same as Ram Sumania, she will be back as well. But um, people have different things to do. So I want to kind of shorten it up at this time because it is after 4. And I told you all, you'll be already at 3. Now let me just reiterate that Morton did his job as a missionary and as a bishop. Next lecture is on him and the Canadian mission. So, other people made their contributions. In the 19th century, John Morton made the greatest contribution. Right? It's all up for discussion. Fellas had a little school where Morton made the greatest contribution. In Trinidad and Trinidad. Right? Williams will come in 1961. The school in, in Point Fortin, before he was Prime Minister, I'm grateful for that too. Yeah? And in between the Hindus did their thing. So I think that's all of us are but the idea is to discuss the finances and the figure. All of us know all our, all our different stuff, I guess in different ways. And as I say we interpret it. We all have a way of looking at things. I have photograph. You guys may have pink, you may have blue, and so on. So I see photograph, you see pink, you see blue, but it's the same thing. It took me years to learn that. If I still want to understand why people can understand what I am saying, but we all see it differently, and that's fine. In terms of the Jose riots, at, um, it was much more than 20 <coughs> people. People went home and died at home. Right? That's the first thing. People dying here in what they call the Cooley Hospital, you still have the existing old buildings behind the main building. One fellow went to the toilet and he collapsed here and died here. Whether they recorded it or not, I don't know. I've heard stories in Cedras where a woman was killed and a hand cut off for her jewels. Now you hear stories, but you can't authenticate them, you want to deal. Thousands of Indians came to San Fernando, not thousands of them. Thousands. The estates here on the other end where I know I presently live for 40 years is Palmis Estate. Mm -hmm. Philippines, which is the main center of the revolt, where Sildar Suku came from, mm -hmm. is up on the hill in Dumka village. Cedar Hill is opposite. Palmis is that way coming down to the river. Then you have Larry's Lost, Narrow Bay. Lagoon, then coming this way you have Woodland, Bend the New, and thousands of people came to the Guarcar Bridge, which was built one year before the revolt in 1883. That bridge, Iron Bridge, came from, uh, from England, still there. Whoever is in charge now could look at it. And the people stopped there when they realized something was amiss, that is, police had lined up on the street. And you had to call them police soldiers, right? They were, ba they were Barbadian policemen. They were not Trinidad African policemen. They blocked the road, and we, we will all define this, but they said it was the Perro Cross. Those who know the Perro Cross is the crossroads of the railway. That is why it's a cross, and we know it's a cross. That is in uh, the fellow's report, the governor's report. So that's where Sipero Cross is. John Ramsaran, of my friend, our friend now deceased, showed me next to TM Tech building, where the street goes on the left, north of Skinner's Park. Skinner's Park was on the Sugarcane, as this place was on the Sugarcane. The whole south of San Francisco was on the Sugarcane. The maps that Jerome has in his book shows the Sugarcane. And then we have toll gate up, up on the hill, as it was, the incline, where uh, sack, or somebody said that, but they, that's where it happened. So it happened somewhere in that quarter mile. So we don't have to fight over that. That is, we don't have to do a rebellion right now, all over. That. It is somewhere, they said, Sipero Cross. We know the people stop on the bridge, so it's not on the bridge. It's Sipero Cross, or it's Tony. Coming east from Princess Town, all those estates, right? Thousands of people came. The reports themselves have two to three thousand, they always on the estate. They were stopped at Monrico where the railway line crosses um, Monrico near the station. 
next to the lecture on Bob Murray's commission, that is where John Ramsar showed me when he was nine people here. Yeah. The, there was a shop there, and the railway line is still on the river. Right? Yeah. Um, Ravi Ji, who I invited, is abroad. He goes by the wrong level. That is not this one. So people came there, and they were killed at that point on the railway line. They were shot. They were murdered. At Just as in India, they were murdered at Sepero Cross, wherever that is, that quarter by war. And the guys coming from Cuba, as far as Cuba, <coughs> California, uh, the estates, uh, Concord, Point of Pair, the old slave estates, where there were rebellions, right, on the slave estates in Point of Pair. And when they, when they beat up the guys and smashed the rebellion, they went into the monstra hills, which is up the road, to live. But those fellas came down when they were saying they touch us. And when they heard what had happened, the first shooting took place at Sipero Cross. That's where the first shooting took place. It's in the actual report. The second report came at one, at one report. There were men on horses, Indian had horses, Indian soldiers. So they were coming to and fro and giving messages. So they said so and so had happened down at the cross. They came to one report. The same thing happened, they shot them. And then at Point of Pair Road, they came to Warakara River. Already, they dropped their charges in the river. It does it work. So nobody was shot up there. They were just coming in the San Fernando here to go down to the wharf, the road we all know. There were 6,000 inhabitants, 7,000 in San Fernando, wooden houses. The police said they are afraid of the riot, and the was going to burn down the house. Now we have 100,000 people in San Fernando. Carnival Kani brings 100,000. You hardly see policemen and the fellas come up and down in Paris. Right? So it's all you interpret the history. But the history is there. It's very interesting. I wish to thank everybody for coming, for discussing. Very, very vibrant. Uh, very vibrant lecture and discussion. Right? Some of you will go to uh, for a late lunch. Please wait, we will all go together. Uh, Can I